questions, if you could stand and let me know if you have one and state your name and affiliation. I heard the question, yes. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. um, Overall, the, the building is 30,000 square metres, uh, and the, the, the cost for the retrofit, which included everything, um, uh, including all of the transport and, uh, and, and water recycle, was in the order of about 25 million. So you can do your numbers on that. Uh, whether you, what your payback period is, it's very interesting, that, because if you look at just from the payback period of uh, how many... Uh, dollars you save on energy utilities, you'll probably find that it goes out well beyond 10, 15 years. But the reason that the building was done is because the, the tenant uh, was demanding that they didn't want, they, they had 30,000 square metres in the building, uh, it was an insurance company, and the insurance company realised that climate change was a very big important part of its business, and it had to see, to, seemed to be demonstrating that it was doing something for climate change. And it said to the, the building owner, we're not going to renew this tenant unless we have a, a high star rated building. Um, and that would cost a lot of money to the building owner in just loss of rent uh, if, if they were to vacate the building. And so the, the, the building owner decided to undertake the upgrade works in order to keep his tenant. How you can work that on a, on a, on a return on basis, uh, I don't know, but it's part of the overall equation uh, of, of the commerce. But can, can you convert that into carbon cost, carbon payback? Carbon costs and carbon payback? Uh, well, I haven't done, no, and I, I might be able to do it in my head at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it, uh, not, in any case, uh, the reason to do it was more commercial um, for, for, the, for the building owner. Mm. Spoken mirrors. Sorry? Smoke and mirrors. <laughs> uh, well, I wouldn't say so. I mean, <clears throat> uh, I think the, the tenant had a, had a true uh, requirement to reduce his carbon uh, emissions. Um, uh, he wanted to demonstrate to his clients, who were the people, um, uh, who, were the people who were um, uh, paying premiums, uh, they saw that the potential of uh, climate change in more, more um, uh, claims uh, and the end result is that they saved a significant amount of carbon um, emissions each year and will continue to. So, okay, it could be seen as smoke and mirrors, but uh, at the same time, the positive result was, uh, the, the result was a positive result. Down here on the right. Uh, Jochen Witt from the Netherlands, DM Consulting. Um, I have a question for Johannes de Jong. Uh, what is the current status of um, the development of uh, linear induction motors in the elevator industry? And how is that development influenced by the current attention for uh, energy consumption and sustainability? Well, if you think about the linear motor, it's actually an elevator without counterweight. So uh, the, the system is very much like a hydraulic elevator with high efficiency. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to consume more energy, that's for sure. It's going to consume about three times the, no, the amount of energy of a conventional elevator. But uh, we, we have to go to something when we go to great heights. Uh, the, the, the problem, however, still at this moment is how are we going to, to cope with emergency situations without causing serious damage to passengers. Uh, gravity is down, uh, so is friction normally when you go up. If you all of a sudden have a power, power cut in this kind of situations, you actually have more than 1G retardation in these cars. And uh, the passenger inside the car will only go with one, will retard with 1G, so he takes off to the roof. Uh, you have to strap them in, yeah? So this becomes a problem. Uh, uh, you can, of course, feed in power, but you have to do that extremely quick, otherwise he's at the roof already. So these kind of uh, problems we are still facing in the industry, we're not ready yet, and I don't expect that to be very ready for, for extreme speeds. Low speed, yes, not for high speed at this moment. In the front. Yeah, um, David Malone from KPF, a question to the panel. Uh, I see a lot of technological innovations, but what kind of energy savings could we get uh, if you change the design criteria? For instance, if the elevator wait times, people could afford to wait another five seconds, or from energy 
if the, if the comfort level could be you know, two, two degrees hotter or colder, in other words, if you change the requirement from the end user, how does that translate into energy savings and, and carbon savings? Well, to be honest again here, uh, what you're actually doing with an elevator system, you're, you're, you're transporting uh, both uh, potential energy moving people, and the second thing you do is uh, moving kinetic energy as well, elevators. Now, whether you try to put them at the same time so in such a way that you save energy, the total result is anyway moving that amount of elevators and that amount of people. So it's not going to change dramatically. We have done this. We even have these kind of options. We've tested that with the University of uh, Hong Kong, with Dr. Sir Albert So, for example. Uh, you will find a few percent reduction, but it's not dramatic. With regard to temperature, um, in, uh, temperature band, if you start to tighten up your temperature band, your energy starts to uh, increase exponentially almost. Um, we've done experiments with real buildings where we've, uh, we've set the temperature bands as far as 19 degrees uh, for winter time and 26 degrees for summer time. Um, the 26 degrees seem to be okay, especially in uh, places like uh, uh, colleges where, um, where people are dressed for the occasion, um, whereas uh, 19 degrees was getting too cold and too uncomfortable, 20 degrees was, was getting to be the, the, the limit. Um, so then you start looking at the equation then of um, if you do start to increase the temperature band too far, then you start to lose productivity issues uh, and the tenants then start walking out. So you can extend it, uh, and my recommendation if you do, from 20 to about 25, 25 and a half at the, the maximum. Um, in the middle. Uh, I'm Lynn Keane from AMB Capital. A uh, question for Lester. Just one of the most significant improvements uh, seem to be Oh, there you go. Here, sorry. <laughs> One of the most significant improvements seems to be just um, utilising the building to its potential. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, existing. What have you done now, looking into the future, to prevent that just slipping again? You know, what, what advice can you give? I guess the facility management wing. Uh, the, 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 the advice that we would give, and um, it, it's a fairly straightforward one in a way, is to to engage an independent commissioning contractor by the building owner to oversee not only the final stages of the design, but also during the construction phase being engaged to make sure everything gets installed correctly, and then commissioning and uh, stage to make sure that the, the contractors are commissioning the building correctly um, to, 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 um, um, to, to make sure that it's working uh, as it's designed, not just so that the PC can be signed off and that final certificate can be, uh, final invoice can be paid for the contractor. We're finding that, that the implementation of a, of, a, of a commissioning contractor has a huge benefits, and it's not a huge investment either. And of course, once, that, once that's done, hopefully your building is working as it should be, as it's designed, you'll still probably not get to the, uh, um, the levels of a perfectly operating building, but you'll get a long way down the track. Before that, though, after saying that, you also need to make sure that the building is designed to be robust in operation. So if something does go wrong, for example, a valve sticks in a hot water reheat coil, then it doesn't send the rest of the building into, uh, into overcooling and reheating for the rest of the building. So the design has to be very robust. And we, we, we actually undertake simulation modeling to see how robust a building is. Uh, what we call it is an off-access analysis. When we, we design your, your actual building, this is how it works perfectly. Then you do your off-access to see if you do do this, that, and the other. Um, if it's not working perfectly, how, how big of an effect, how sensitive is your building to energy consumption after that. So that, that actually happens very much in the concept stage as well. So those two things combined um, will, will, have, will pay big dividends, huge dividends. I'm going to have to make this the last question here in the middle. Ray. Yes, okay. Ray Carbo, DLS Consulting Engineers. I have a question from Dr. Becker. Uh, as you know, Dubai is a lot of time dusty. Uh, do, do you have any study uh, effect of dust in on heat island in the city? Yes, so we have. I mean, studied. Uh, yes, we have. I mean, studied. I mean, uh, the dust and the heat island effect. Actually, I mean, uh, I uh, had a um, presentation was prepared for all that. Uh, it's a lack of time. Uh, the dust, uh, most of the dust is uh, we are expecting from the south direction. And how can we suspend, I mean, uh, the dust and divert it from the region which we are, I mean, uh, not want to have it? It's not, I mean, something simple, which we, I mean, the 
picture which I showed you is the initial, I mean, stage which we are thinking, okay, if we have, I mean, something which blocks it and then accelerate, we have seen, I mean, the wind is diverted up, then to what extent can we uh, divert that one on top of the towers? And will that be, I mean, practical? Can we have, I mean, uh, uh, the, how many, I mean, towers do we need? Do we want to sacrifice them? Uh, there is a lot of, I mean, questions which we raised, I mean, a detailed study uh, of uh, the dust. Uh, the heat island effect, yes, we have, I mean, studied uh, the heat island effect. And on the heat island effect, we have considered, I mean, the transportation, uh, what kind of, I mean, heat they are producing. And we calculated, I mean, uh, there are, I mean, two factors which produces the uh, heat island effect. One is the main source of uh, energy is the sun, which we are getting directly, and what kind of, I mean, materials we have to use. When we, uh, I was talking about sun shades, is very important. Uh, we, how we have to arrange, I mean, the towers to get the maximum shades, and what kind of materials, I mean, high albedo materials, we have to use to reduce, I mean, the heat uh, absorption. Uh, also, the vegetation, which we have I mean, measured here, is to promote and how should it be? I mean, if you have, I mean, a vegetation in one particular place, will that reduce it? Or is it good, I mean, to distribute it on the streets? And we consider all those, I mean, to evaluate, I mean, the heat island effect. In uh, bringing to a close, um, I'd like to highlight perhaps points made by both uh, Brian Ford and Mr. Partridge to do with ventilation and to do with um, existing buildings. As we heard this morning, 98% of the consumption of buildings is in existing buildings. If we take the uh, apoplectic vision uh, of, of the future, uh, unless we do something about existing building stock, we're actually not going to make any inroads into our total consumption. Um, would you please join me in thanking our four speakers and I'll give them a little presentation as you do that.